Hi everyone, this is the second part of the first lecture in uh, the biofuels segment. And uh, in the first lecture, or the first part of this lecture, we spoke about the uh, types of biofuels that we get, uh, why we need them, and some advantages and disadvantages of biofuels, and also how biomass can be converted to a usable biofuel. So we're going to continue talking today about um, the currently used biofuels, the, uh, the three biggest types of biofuels that are used in the world at the moment are bioethanol, biodiesel and biogas. Bioethanol, uh, over 140 billion litres uh, produced in 2018, uh, almost half of that in the USA and almost exclusively there made from so-called corn ethanol. Biodiesel, about 36 billion litres produced in 2018, mostly in the uh, European Union, where biodiesel is the preferred biofuel. And all over the world, quite a lot of biogas um, has, is being produced. And we shall see the reason why that is so. So first, let's talk about ethanol as a biofuel, um, the most commonly used biofuel in the world. Ethanol uh, is a high performance fuel. It's got a high octane rating. Uh, it was the first commercial vehicle, the first commercial vehicle that was actually made to run on pure ethanol was the Model T Ford well over 100 years ago and it was actually thought that ethanol would be a good fuel uh, for this vehicle and other vehicles uh, at the time. Of course in the, in the meantime petroleum um, became accepted because it just became very cheap to produce and uh, to transport everywhere. So, uh, but the point is that the idea of ethanol as a biofuel is not a new one. Um, it's an excellent fuel oxygenate. It can be blended with petrol up to 10% um, without giving any problems in conventional engines. So any conventional petrol engine, we can take a blend of 90% petrol and 10% ethanol, run that car, uh, no problem. Um, we can blend higher amounts of ethanol into our fuel. You can make up to a so-called E85, which is 85% ethanol. Uh, but then you require specific modifications to the engine, and that's what we call flex fuel cars or flexible fuel vehicles. So in Brazil, they make a specific uh, flex fuel vehicle that can run up to 100% ethanol. And in fact, you can put in pure petrol, pure ethanol. You can decide on the day what, which is cheaper, and um, those uh, flex fuel vehicles in Brazil um, can handle them uh, with no issues. In Sweden, there's a company called Scania that have developed a fleet of buses that use uh, so-called ED95, which is 95% ethanol and a proprietary mix of uh, additives. And it runs actually like a diesel engine. So it's like a compression engine, uh, which burns very cleanly and uses this large amount of ethanol. Um, ethanol does have a lower energy density than petrol. It's only about 66% of the amount of, of uh, energy in a litre ethanol than there is in a litre petrol, uh, which means you'll be fueling up much more if you're running on ethanol alone. And current vehicles de are developed for petrol, so um, you will get higher ethanol consumption. The, the idea is that if ethanol is considered more as a primary fuel rather than a fuel extender, um, vehicles will be developed specifically to run on ethanol and you might get much better performance um, from, uh, from an ethanol uh, as a fuel compared to petrol. So um, there are different types of feedstocks from which the ethanol is produced that is used as a biofuel. Um, the first type is, is sugar crops. Um, this is sugar cane, sugar beet and uh, sweet sorghum. Sugar cane is what is used most often in, in South America and Brazil specifically um, to produce uh, sugar. Of course, it's sugar cane is used to produce sugar everywhere, but they then in Brazil will take this uh, sugar and ferment it to ethanol. Um, that is where most Brazilian uh, bioethanol comes from. Um, and then the other way of doing it, uh, which is still considered a first generation technology, is to use starch um, where where you will use the starch from maize or wheat or grain sorghum and then hydrolyze that starch to free sugars and then ferment that free sugars um, into ethanol. So in America they use corn or which we call maize. Um, however in South Africa it is not allowed to make a biofuel from maize as it is considered a, a risk to our food security. And we spoke briefly about the uh, food versus fuel debate um, in the first video. Then uh, another a newer way of producing um, bioethanol as a fuel is from lignocellulose. 
um, that is considered a second generation technology. So what is lignus cellulose? It is the, uh, the, the, uh, the part of the plant that isn't the fruit, no, the non-edible part of the plant. The plant's cell walls contain a lot of cellulose and hemicellulose. Um, those are uh, basically sugar polymers that we hope to be able to break down, release those sugars and then um, produce an ethanol from them. Um, so we uh, foresee that you can use agricultural or forestry residues um, for this, that we can use energy crops that are grown specifically to produce ethanol, such as switchgrass and miscanthus, um, or that we can use in South Africa, we have a problem with uh, things like invasive species like uh, Port, Jackson, Port Jackson bushes, etc., cetera, um, that, that have to be removed by law um, because they're a drain on the water supply and that can then potentially also be a, um, a feedstock for producing bioethanol from a, a second generation source. Um, so there are a number of, of advantages of ethanol. The first of those is that, as we said, it's, it's quite compatible with existing technology. We can blend it into our fuels and um, we can burn a, a, the ethanol as a fuel in, in cars if we don't exceed that 10% barrier. Um, we can uh, get significant environmental benefits from this fuel. Uh, it's uh, far um, better uh, in terms of uh, carbon emissions than you would get for burning uh, fossil fuels. The uh, large scale production of bioethanol for use as a fuel has been demonstrated in the US and also in Brazil. This is just an example, a uh, picture that a colleague of mine took in Brazil for at, at a Shell garage where you can actually, as I said, buy ethanol or you can buy petrol um, and uh, you can decide what's the better price for your vehicle that day and put that in. So they do this at very large scale in Brazil and it's, it's cost competitive. So um, potentially uh, ethanol production can be, a, 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 can stimulate um, the creation of new jobs. It can stimulate um, new agriculture. Um, it can give new markets for agriculture. Um, so there's a lot of associated uh, development um, advantages there. It is also, we mentioned earlier, uh, energy security for countries without large oil reserves. If you can produce a large amount of ethanol, to take, you can take a lot of pressure off these imports of oil um, that you would need to do if you don't produce enough of your own oil, which very few countries in the world obviously do. So um, ethanol can also be converted into other fuels and other chemicals, for example, uh, into jet fuels. There are some disadvantages, some challenges to ethanol as well. Um, the first is an economies of scale challenge, which means that in order to produce ethanol um, at a price that is actually um, going to, to be acceptable in the market, you need to be able to, to produce quite a lot of, of, um, of ethanol to begin with. So the estimate is that you need to be producing between 100 and 200 million liters per year. Um, and that has feedstock challenges. How do you get enough feedstock to your biorefinery in order to be able to produce that much ethanol continually? So um, I have seen other estimations where they, they estimate that you can still have um, uh, good enough economies of scale, even at 40 million liters per annum. Uh, but generally it's considered the, the more you can go, the bigger, uh, larger the amount you can produce, um, the better the, the economy um, is, uh, the, the, the feasibility of your um, ethanol plant is going to be. So um, the other significant challenge is that it's not like petrol. You cannot pump ethanol in our existing petroleum pipelines. It mixes with water. And so therefore you have to uh, actually mix your ethanol with your petrol if you're selling it in that way as a mixture at the delivery point. So um, you do need, as we said, uh, engine adjustments if you are using um, levels of higher than 10% um, ethanol in your ethanol petrol mixture for your uh, engines to be working properly. We do also have that problem, um, as mentioned, that we have a lower energy density, uh, which means that you, in conventional engines, you will consume energy from, um, because there's less energy in ethanol than petrol, you'll um, run out of your fuel a little bit earlier. You'll need to refill 
if you're filling with ethanol um, more frequently. First generation ethanol, as we mentioned, can compete with food production if it's not well managed and um, for significant production uh, of ethanol as an alternative fuel there are challenges with land use we mentioned the indirect land use problem um, where if we're growing energy crops on fields that are supposed to be used for food production um, you your challenges to overall food production should be considered although cellulosic ethanol um, which we make from that lignocellulosic material um, can overcome some of these challenges if well managed because remember there we're using not the seed part of the plant, but the rest of the biomass that remains. So moving on to biodiesel. Biodiesel is a very interesting uh, fuel and, and very widely used. The idea of using a vegetable oil as an, as an engine fuel actually also dates back a very long time. So Rudolf Diesel originally developed the first engine to run on, uh, diesel engine to run on, on peanut oil, which he demonstrated um, all the way back in 1900. Um, however, soon after the invention uh, and introduction of diesel engines, the use of petroleum-based fuels became the norm, again, just because it became much easier to produce at large amounts um, and uh, ship all over the place where it's needed. So today, biodiesel is actually the most common fuel, uh, biofuel type used in Europe because the, new, uh, the use of biofuel or biodiesel, I should say, with modern diesel engines is a relatively new notion. The use of biodiesel in modern diesel engines should be done with caution um, because those engines are engineered for petrochemical diesel and we'll discuss some of the, the problems a little bit later on. So biodiesel can basically be made from any kind of oily feedstock. Um, this includes animal fats, veg vegetable oils, soy, rapeseed, jatropha, sunflower, palm oil, algae and even a, a lot of others that I'm not going to mention here. It's actually a relatively simple process of making them. Um, biodiesel, as we know today, is really just a modification of the original vegetable oil um, engine. Uh, it's essentially an ester-based fuel, a fatty acid ester, that is generally made through a very simple transesterification process from these vegetable oils that I've mentioned. And it yields a liquid similar in composition to the, the fossil or mineral diesel um, that you would normally buy. So you'd need some sort of oil, some sort of fat, vegetable oil, animal fat, uh, waste cooking oil, etc. Um, you would mix it with a methanol and a catalyst. This methanol can also be, uh, that's what you're going to esterify it with. It can also be ethanol. Um, the catalyst, there's different type of bases. You can also use acid catalysts. Um, this transesterification process happens and it leaves you with biodiesel and glycerol. This is basically what it would look like. You have that glycerol at the bottom there, and then this, what you have in here, is your um, transesterified um, biodiesel. And you can do this at, at, at different scales. It's one of the big advantages of biodiesel, is that you don't need to do this at very large scale. So what that looks like um, at a molecular level, I hope my uh, 322 students will remember what a triglyceride looks like, is your three fatty acids um, and your glycerol. And we have our methanol and our um, base, which is uh, uh, the catalyst. We get the transesterification that happens, and there's your biodiesel now, um, and the glycerol gets released. And so that's why we have that glycerol byproduct that forms there. So looking at uh, the advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of biodiesel as a biofuel, um, it is very compatible, again, with existing technology. Uh, so it can be used in conven conventional engines as is. Although, depending on the type of oil you use um, and the type of transesterification, you can get some oil contamination. So they, if you're using a biofuel, it is advisable to use special types of filters as well to get the particles out of the biofuel um, so that it doesn't damage the engine. It is very simple to produce. It can literally be done in the backyard. I've seen it done. Um, there are small companies in the Western Cape that go around collecting uh, the, the, the spent oils from, um, from fast food places and um, actually produce their own biodiesel. Um, it's got a relatively short ignition delay compared to standard diesel, so it, um, it ignites quite uh, early on in the compression, which makes the burning very efficient. It doesn't have sulfur content by definition, so it doesn't um, contribute to sulfur 
um, as, a, as a greenhouse gas and doesn't contribute to, to acid rain. Um, overall, the process produces less carbon dioxide than you would for mineral diesel, and it actually has better lubrication properties compared to your standard diesel. There are significant disadvantages though. It's um, quite expensive if you're using not waste oil, and of course there's not waste oil enough for everybody to be uh, producing their biodiesel in that way. Um, the cost of the virgin vegetable oils are too expensive. and It only really becomes competitive with the price of diesel over 15 rand a litre. So there are limited quantities of waste oil, as I, as I mentioned, um, available um, to make your biodiesel at a reduced cost. You can also release uh, nitrogen oxide in this process um, because of the fertilizers um, that, that might be used in the production of these seed oils, which uh, contributes to smog formation. These biofuels actually solidify at a relatively low temperature. Um, and at those temperatures, your mineral diesel wouldn't solidify yet. And so that is a real problem when uh, biodiesel is used in, in the um, colder Northern European countries. And you have to mix biodiesel with a conventional diesel to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, again, if you're planting seeds to produce biodiesel, uh, then you are competing for land usage with food production. And um, algal biodiesel might solve a number of these problems but we have significant cultivation problems with those. So looking then at some of the feedstocks um, that we can use for biodiesel and how effectively we can produce oil per hectare for these feedstocks. You see not all these feedstocks are created the same um, and it would, for example, not be a good idea to really use soybean or sunflower um, as a feedstock for biodiesel production. You don't get that much oil uh, per, uh, per hectare. Um, Palm oil starts making a lot more sense, even though we mentioned earlier the, uh, the, the problems that you have with the production of uh, palm oil um, requiring the clearing of rainforests and, and, and the associated problems with lack of biodiversity and release of carbon dioxide. Um, one thing that jumps off the page here is the, the, the theoretical amount of oil per hectare that can be produced using algae. So this is, of course, something that's grabbed people's attention and um, that is, has, has gained quite a lot of attention over the last uh, few decades or so. But the problem um, with algae uh, is that it's no silver bullet yet because those uh, values are theoretically um, extrapolated from, from values of, of uh, oil production from algae that was produced in the lab. And really, the only way of doing um, algae production in large scale is using these so-called race ponds. These are these oval ponds uh, with a paddle wheel that keeps the water moving um, and, and moving around in this oval. And then you can get the algae grown in there. So um, they're the only really economic way of producing algae at the moment. But you've got productivity um, challenges there. You don't really produce those high amounts of, of, uh, of oil in these rice ponds, and you get contamination problems as well. Um, these large scale facilities that you see over here um, are for the production of um, higher value uh, fatty acids out of these um, algae, and it's not actually for fuel production. Um, you can use these uh, glass or, or perspex um, bioreactors where you can actually bubble carbon dioxide through and you can actually get much higher levels of, um, of algae biomass. However, these are quite expensive. There is some research um, that will couple these to the use of wastewater um, from, from factories or waste carbon dioxide that come off, for example, steel factories. And um, that uh, is still not uh, commercial, but that is something that's being uh, research at the moment and we'll spend some time in the rest of the course uh, on that as well. So looking then at the third type of biofuel that we'll discuss is uh, biogas. Uh, biogas is a mixture of uh, methane and carbon dioxide um, and well as, as, as well as some other gases and it's produced by a process of anaerobic digestion of organic material by consortia of anaerobic microbes. So um, we also uh, get something that's called landfill gas, and that is when biological material is put in, in landfill, um, they will start producing um, ethanol because of the, the natural microbial activity and release methane. 
um, that is a kind of a less clean form of biogas. Um, there are efforts in order because uh, methane is a very powerful um, greenhouse gas to kind of capture the landfill gas. And I know that um, there are a few municipalities in South Africa that um, are actually using that methane to, to run uh, electricity generators um, that provide enough electricity to run that plant. So the production of uh, biogas is actually also a relatively simple process. Um, we looking at the simple scheme, what you basically need is a mixing tank and an inlet chamber where your feedstock is put in. Uh, this then goes into your uh, anaerobic digester where you have a microbial consortium that actually uh, in a three phase process turns your feedstock into methane and um, your methane can then be be caught um, and uh, kept under pressure and these uh, th this gas can then be used for cooking or for heating or to produce electricity um, the outlet chamber and overflow tank will then um, essentially collect what is not digested and this can be used as fertilizer so the advantages of, of biogas as a biofuel is that it can be uh, produced from any biodegradable waste material theoretically uh, fruit and vegetable waste, cow manure, etc., um, or by the use of energy crops that you produce specifically for biogas production. Um, these can be fed into your anaerobic digester um, to supplement uh, gas yields. You can also use combinations of these different types of feedstocks. Um, you can use that fuel, as I mentioned, for domestic purposes, for heating and cooking and, and lighting. Um, you can use it for uh, electricity production. And it also helps us with improving waste management, uh, reducing air and water pollution, and creating more environmentally friendly fertilizers. Um, and it's also very scalable technology. Depending on the amount of feedstock you have, you can build a relatively small biogas production um, facility, again, even a backyard facility, um, up to a, a very large facility like you would have for that um, buyer to what, uh, which is a company that uh, uses cow manure um, to produce uh, electricity, which is then sold to a BMW facility close to Pretoria. The disadvantage of, um, of biogas is that if it escapes, that methane is a very powerful uh, greenhouse gas, so you have to be careful in this process. It is not a highly efficient um, process in terms of energy conversion and happens relatively slowly and you, there's a lot of loss among the way as well. Um, and it is not really concentrated enough for large-scale use and distribution. Um, the advantage, though, is that because of that scalability, you can really build these uh, facilities uh, kind of where you can use them. It's not like with bioethanol that I mentioned, you have to have this huge uh, economy of scale in order to, to actually make it economically feasible. So looking then at the classification of biofuels, I've kind of mentioned first and second generation biofuels already. First generation biofuels then, um, to, to put the proper definition to it, is conventional biofuels, uh, including ethanol that is produced from sugar and starch feedstocks, or biodiesel that is produced from vegetable oil, um, and also includes biogas and syngas. Those are your first generation biofuels. Second generation biofuels um, is ethanol or other liquid fuels like butanol that are produced from a lignocellulosic biomass. So this is our uh, wood, our agricultural waste, our energy crops. Um, that are specifically um, these, these kind of plant waste products that we will use to produce ethanol or butanol. And then third generation biofuels are defined as uh, the specific biodiesel that you make from algal oils. So um, the first generation biofuels are those are ones that are uh, in use today. As I said, this is biofuels made from sugar, starch, um, if we're talking about ethanol or from, from vegetable oils or animal fats if we're talking about biodiesel. Um, using those conventional technologies of uh, fermentation for the production of ethanol and the transesterification for production of biodiesel. Um, the basic feedstocks for the production um, of these uh, fuels are often seeds or grains, such as wheat or maize for starch, uh, which can be fermented to bioethanol, or the sunflower seeds that can be pressed to yield a vegetable oil that is used in biodiesel. Um, these are often quite mature technologies, um, They've been used for decades, which means that uh, the methods are very well defined um, all over the world. 
Okay, second generation biofuels, I mentioned this is um, what we use the lignocellulosic biomass for. It's also sometimes called cellulosic ethanol for this reason. So it's ethanol produced from these lignocellulosic feedstocks, which are wood, grasses, the non-edible parts of plants, um, and very importantly, agricultural wastes. So lignocellulose is that dry plant matter, also called lignocellulosic biomass. Um, it's the most abundantly available raw material on earth for the production of biofuels, which is why we are so interested in it and why we'll spend such a significant part in this course on um, production of fuels from lignocellulose. And uh, it is composed of uh, carbohydrate polymers, um, cellulose and hemicellulose, as well as aromatic polymers, um, which is lignin. And those are actually to support the plant structure. So um, we will discuss advantages and disadvantages of these a little bit more in, in, in further lectures. Um, generally, the processing, the production of ethanol from, from, uh, from lignin cellulose is quite an expensive process. You need expensive pretreatment, you need expensive enzymes, uh, you require fertilizers to grow them, and there's also the land use problems. This is if you're using um, some of these energy crops like um, scanthus um, that is demonstrated here. Okay, so why is, is, uh, is it so difficult to break um, the lignocellulose down? Well, one of the main polymers that we're interested in here is cellulose. And cellulose is made up of these chains of glucose that are bound together in a so-called beta-1,4 bond. Um, it's a homopolymer. It's not substituted. We don't have side chains. And because of that, these um, cellulose chains will actually associate in these microfibrils where they lie on top of each other. You have these uh, hydrogen and, and van der Waals forces that are actually uh, allowing them to interact very closely together. Um, the microfibrils will associate into fibrils, and we call that a crystalline cellulose structure. Not even water enters there, and of course, if water is not entering, um, then it means we don't actually uh, get uh, enzymatic breakdown. So um, these structures have to be opened up through some kind of heat or chemical treatment to allow the enzymes to get in there and allow us to, to break down the cellulose um, in a relatively quick and efficient manner. Further complicating the process is that the other sugar polymer hemicellulose closely associates with uh, the cellulose microfibrils, um, and um, the hemicellulose is covalently bound to lignin, that um, aromatic polymer. And all of this forms a, a matrix together, which uh, is part of the plant cell wall, and it's what actually gives the plant cell wall that strength and rigidity. And it's actually evolved to not uh, be uh, broken down very easily by enzymes so that the plant can actually survive. And so this is the problem that we need to overcome in second generation bioethanol is to get this what we call recalcitrant uh, polymers uh, to be broken down very efficiently and release the sugar so that we can um, ferment them to ethanol. So how that process essentially then works, how cellulosic ethanol is made, we have to collect our biomass first. Uh, it's got to be taken to our ethanol production facility. It's got to be shredded or size reduced in some way, uh, ground down to, to small particles, and then treated with heat and chemicals to open up that cellulose and hemicellulose structure and uh, make it accessible to enzymes. Then we've got to get uh, a third step is the actual enzyme um, working on the substrate, so enzymatic hydrolysis that releases these uh, sugar monomers which can be then in the fourth step fermented by a microbe. And it's normally yeast, um, that is the industry standard. Yeast will then ferment our sugars to ethanol, which then has to be distilled um, and, and dried. Uh, water removal um, has to take place before this ethanol can be distributed for use. Uh, essentially, that is the process of, of uh, second generation production of ethanol. Okay, then the third generation biofuels, we said this is algal biofuels, uh, biodiesel uh, from uh, the algal biomass or algae oils. The advantages here is that algae can be quite fast growing. They can absorb carbon dioxide, which is a big plus. Um, they can use wastewater and non-arable land. You don't need to um, use cropland to produce uh, algae in theory. Um, and then based on laboratory experiments, it is claimed that algae can produce over 30 times more energy per hectare or per acre than um, land crops such as soybeans. So uh, the problems though is that when you actually get to the commercial upscaling, um, algae turns out to be quite expensive to grow and to harvest. 
you have contamination problems and you get um, unknown and unwanted byproducts that is produced at the same time. Um, you do have lower um, gas emissions um, and there's still quite a lot of, of research taking place for algal biofuels because it is still seen as quite promising. But it's certainly no, uh, no silver bullet to, to solve our biofuels problems yet. Okay, that is the end of this lecture, the introductory lecture for uh, biofuels, and um, we will continue with the second lecture that I will post a little bit later on.